Okay, is it on? Yeah. Okay. God, I just thank you for um, this nation, Lord, and I pray that your grace and that your love would just abound over this nation. Um, and God, I pray that it would start right here in the name of Jesus, Lord. I pray for every person that um, works in Washington that is a government official, Lord. I pray that your love um, would touch them, that you would transform them, Lord, in Jesus' name. And I pray that it would start here and that it would touch our entire nation. And I pray for a revival in your church over this nation in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord, that you are Lord and that you're King over this entire country in Jesus' name. Then my Amen. heart cries out, you will reign forevermore. I love you, Lord.
Okay. Evet. Istanbul was awesome. Uh, man, we did so much shopping. We did so many different tourist things. And I thought before I got there that it was going to be some dirty place, wasn't going to be fun, uh, nasty food, mean people. But gosh, it was just, it was so awesome because there were so many different fun things to do. It seemed like everyone that I ran into and had an encounter with was funny, cracking jokes with me, making me tea, giving me like free stuff. Um, and it was just so much more than what I expected. Um, I was impressed. Surprisingly, there were a lot of experiences with people there that were just random people, but they would uh, either crack a joke to me or at me or small talk with me through Ryan. Um, and so it was just so cool uh, to be outside of the United States, but have that first experience outside of the United States be really fun. I don't believe my eyes. You see me this year. <laughs> Oh my gosh. You like it? That's weird. <laughs> That's really weird. So yeah, the first couple of days we just did the tourist thing. Uh, from early in the morning to late at night, we would just go to all of the main places, see the main sites. Um, do the main tourist things and it was awesome because I love being um, an ignorant tourist or someone leading me around showing me the awesome things of the city. We saw the Blue Mosque, the Hagia Sophia, the underground cisterns, we went to a museum, uh, we went to the tourist area where there are just all these different um, shops, stores, um, souvenirs, everywhere and so it was just really cool to me to be in this foreign environment, no one speaks my language, uh, but have fun doing it. And I didn't think it was going to be fun, but the trip, man, it was just so, um, so much more than what I expected. And by the end of our time in Istanbul, which was the first two or three days of the trip, uh, I didn't want to leave. 
I just wanted to keep trying the weird food that ended up being really awesome. I just wanted to keep um, going to different places and just seeing different sites because it was so much cooler uh, than I thought it was going to be. By the end of the trip, I didn't even want to leave. But those first two or three days were just kind of designated for Istanbul to see different sites there um, and to do the tourist thing there before we left to go to the trip uh, to the seven churches. So the trip to the seven churches, um, we booked a flight to leave at about 5 a.m. one morning. And so we wake up extremely early and we fly from Istanbul to Izmir, which is modern day Smyrna. And the plan was, as soon as we got there, get a rental car, hop in the rental car, and just go for it. And Istanbul is northwest Turkey. And all seven of these ancient sites are um, south of Istanbul. And they're all kind of in a group. And I would say each of them are about an hour to two hours apart. And so the plan was to just hit this crazy road trip. We took it as a challenge. We were really excited about it. Um, and we got it done. We had to shoot one video at night in the pitch black dark. But we got to each place in two days. And it was awesome. What I would have liked to be perfect shots, perfect lighting, uh, all the time in the world to get this stuff done, it quickly became a game of you have to capture something on video to take home. And whether it looks perfect or whether it looks like complete crap, you've got to go with what you get. And so um, to me, if I could go back and do it perfectly, I don't think it would have, I don't think it would be as cool as the way it came out, which is not perfect. And you can tell that certain parts are rushed, certain parts are not perfect, certain parts are just kind of like um, pieced together. But I think it's cooler that way because it's almost like you get to experience the same trip that we did. Everything I've eaten I've liked. Every place that we went or every site that we saw, I liked. Um, maybe the biggest misconception was that uh, I would get harassed or something for being an American or for being a Christian or something like that. Like someone would be waiting at the airport <laughs> with a gun to just cap me. Uh, but man, people are really nice. I got to meet a Turkish family in their home. They served me coffee. Um, they cracked jokes with me, which was awesome. Basically, in Revelation 1, the Lord Jesus appears to the Apostle John, and he tells him to write down a specific message to each of these seven cities of that time. And in that time, that would have been ancient Asia Minor and modern-day Turkey. And so he gives John this really specific message to each of these seven churches, and basically he gives them a rebuke or an encouragement. Um, he tells them what they're doing right, tells them what they're doing wrong, and um, so each message was to be written down and taken to that city. And so the plan was to go visit the ancient ruins of those seven cities and read the scripture while standing in the middle of the actual site. 777 stands for the seven churches, the seven messages, and the seven revelations of Jesus, which is the most important because we want to know what he's like. And so in these messages, he reveals himself, um, different things about his character, different things about his personality, different things about what he values. And so 
we can kind of draw that out of these seven passages of Scripture because he shows himself in different ways. And when you put all these revelations together, you get an awesome picture of who Jesus is. Ancient aqueducts. Look at that. Yeah, which place is it? Smyrna? Alexander the Great is credited with finding Smyrna. Uh, it was an ancient city that was around much, much earlier, but it kind of died down, and Alexander the Great was having a nap under a tree, um, and he had a dream about, you know, refinding the city Smyrna. I was kind of bummed when I realized that we, we might not get to go to Smyrna, because for me, Smyrna was the most important. And the reason why is because the, the message to Smyrna has resounded in me more than any of the other churches and just because of some personal things and and some things that i feel like the lord has been trying to develop in me but that the message to that church was the most important to me so i wanted to be sure to go there and i and i would have sacrificed other places just to be able to see smyrna and so um because we didn't think we were going to get to go there i wasn't really prepared to do any kind of video there and so what you see when you watch the video is, um, is kind of improv. Uh, pause them. And I felt like I would read the scripture so much that I was confident that I could just do a video anyway. But um, I really wasn't prepared, as prepared as I would have liked to be. Smyrna was a, a cool site. Um, it's one of the few cities that actually is, is still a city today. Most of them have been destroyed and abandoned over time, but uh, Smyrna actually developed into Izmir, which is one of the biggest cities in Turkey today. Um, it, it was fun there. We, uh, we got kicked out uh, for filming there on site, and uh, the, the lady just said, you know, you can't use tripods. And, and we didn't use the tripod, but uh, she didn't she didn't believe us and, and escorted us out of the park. So this is ancient Smyrna. And Revelation 2, starting in verse 8, it says, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews, and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. The name Smyrna actually means in Greek, it's the word for myrrh, which was a perfume, a fragrant perfume that they would use in embalming dead bodies. And so this myrrh would come from a, a resin from a tree. And what you did was you would crush it. And whenever you crushed it, it gave off the fragrant scent. And so that is just so symbolic of uh, the, the church in Smyrna because it was like they're going through these crushing circumstances they're going through the these hard trials and persecution but to the lord whenever they're crushed for him or in his name it comes off to him as a fragrant scent i would have liked to do more video more talking more cool shots but this woman comes up out of nowhere uh one of the worker employee ladies and starts getting onto us for the tripod i believe um, but we weren't even using it. Uh, we had already been told to not, so Ryan put it on the ground. Totally weren't using it, and then she starts yelling in Turkish, so I don't know what the heck she's saying, but it's just funny to hear and kind of scary in a way because she seemed like she was going to like punch one of us or something. But 
So we get in trouble. Uh, did we get kicked out, actually? We got kicked out. <laughs> yeah, we got kicked out of there. And uh, so the video that we got was, I feel like, halfway done. And it could have been better, there could have been more. But just the fact that we got something done there is cool to me, regardless. This is so not playing. I feel bad, but I did, dude. It wasn't smooth. Really? That's cool. That's cool. Because I like it was smooth, and then I had one. Can I see that? Thank you so much. I am not prepared for this. At all. But I'm glad we got to come. That's the biggest thing. Tell her we're not using the tripod. Uh, she No. We didn't use it. The guy already got onto it. The guy, Adam Gandhi's almost killed him. It was laying on the ground the whole time. And we're using it. Siz şu an yaptığınız ceza hayır 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 siz birlikte girdiniz. We didn't use it. It's problem. We didn't use it. You kullanmadık. Kullandınız? Hayır. Kullandığınız gördük. Hayır. It was awesome road tripping through Turkey. I mean, I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would do anything like that. And I know that's I know that's kind of a cliche thing to say, but until you're in the situation, man, it's just like it was awesome. And it was definitely one of the best things, if not the best thing I've ever done in my life. Pergamum was probably the craziest experience. Um, I mean, from the moment that we got there, it was just different. Uh, it was just crazy. Um, random things kept happening. We get there, and per like the ancient Pergamum, which is modern day Bergama, but a ancient Pergamum sits on top of this huge mountain, and so you're overlooking the city, and it's the most beautiful sight ever. And so it just took me a minute to kind of catch my breath and realize like wow this is all real stuff so as soon as we get there uh the very first thing that we see are these little vendors set up selling souvenirs and we run into this character uh he's selling these hats and his tactics are a little different he decides to get a few hats and just start putting them on us uh without us even asking and he's got this like super thick like uncle mustache and this like kind of funny looking scarf and he was just so like animated and hilarious tell me about this place where am i what is this place where are we today <laughs> I just want to know where we are. Yeah. I'm still here, nice stuff here. <laughs> He's not getting me. Cheaper than Walmart, better than Walmart here. You should say Target, not Walmart. How you doing?
Gel lan buraya. Gel lan buraya. Oha. Lan. Oha. Teşekkürler. Or he tries to stick a hat on me, but I take off in the other direction. Uh, and he just like starts yelling at me like in this really funny way. But it was awesome to see and experience all these different things and have them be in other languages and me not know what the heck is going on. And so that in a way like made it cooler to me and the way my mind interpreted things. Pergamon was kind of, uh, it was interesting because it was just kind of like a, um, all, all, it was like a center for, for pagan worship and there were all these different idols and um, one of the first, first uh, temples to, to the Caesar was there in Pergamon. When, when we got to Pergamon, uh, it, it's amazing how you know, you're driving along and it's pretty warm and then you go up on the mountain in Pergamon and all of a sudden it's freezing. Uh, the wind's just blowing like crazy. And uh, Pergamon was one of the sites where we didn't have much time. Uh, in order to stay on our schedule, we had to get in and get out and try to get as much footage as we could. And so when we got to Pergamon, we were like, okay, let's, let's book it. The craziest thing about it was the fact that when you watch the video, the cameras are just shutting down, everything's just malfunctioning. And it was like, it was too, the timing was just too weird to not be spiritual warfare. The timing was too weird for it to not be some kind of spiritual opposition. And so as you're watching, you'll, as you're watching it, you'll see the main camera on me and the secondary camera getting the side shot and what happens is most of the way uh through the, me reading the scripture and like talking the main camera shuts down and so the only thing that's left is the secondary camera and then the other thing that happens is the sound uh my audio recorder shuts off like as I'm talking but I don't realize it until later and so we have the secondary camera move to the main shot while Ryan is over trying to fix his camera and all this time, my audio recorder is not working, and I think it is. And so uh, I like keep going for it, and then this camera shuts down. But uh, we're fortunate enough that Ryan fixes his camera and clicks it back on. So it's like he clicks his on, and then this one shuts down, and then Ryan's is like capturing what's left. And like somewhere in there, I realize that the audio recorder is not working, and I'm just like, man, this is crazy. And so I try to turn it back on, um, and then the battery dies. And so I'm like, great. And I pull out my phone to try to get audio on my phone. And then what you don't see is that I drop my phone during this whole thing, and my phone is already like cracked like no other. And so it was just this really weird string of events that happened. And so uh, you'll see that I turn to the left and kind of like ruin the whole shot, but I turn just so that we can get something on camera because all these cameras are like shutting down and like cards are full and just random stuff keeps happening. To the angel of the church of Pergamum, right? These are the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you have also... Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. 
Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. And so in this passage, Jesus reveals himself as the one who has a sharp double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And this is consistent with Revelation 19, where Jesus reveals himself as a judge. He returns to the earth, and he makes war against the evil leadership of the earth. And so he's revealing himself as a judge, but he also encourages them for staying faithful in times of persecution and when martyrdom seems to be. And he also encourages them for staying faithful to him in times of persecution and in martyrdom. The things that he has against this church are that they're holding to false teaching and also that they're given to idolatry and sexual immorality. And at the end, he offers a reward that he'll give some of the hidden manna to those um, who stay true to his name in a white stone with the name written on it that no one knows but themselves. Okay, pause for 30 seconds. In this passage, reveals himself as a God who prioritizes faithfulness over the well-being of his people here on earth. And that he encourages faithfulness in times where their surroundings are evil or there's hardship surrounding us. He encourages the faithfulness even to the point of death. And he also uh, speaks against holding to false teaching. He speaks against it. Uh, So in this, Jesus is encouraging faithfulness to his name, despite the hardships that are going on around us. And he also speaks against holding to false teaching, to idolatry, and to sexual immorality. But he's showing himself as a God who um, encourages his people. He's giving this church an encouraging word. But the revelation that he gives of himself is as one who has a sharp sword in his mouth. And he will speak against us when, when that need there he will speak against us um, when we need to be corrected or when we need to be straightened out um, but he also shows himself as one who will the scripture this is crazy recording So what Jesus is revealing himself to this church as one who has a sharp double-edged sword in his mouth. And the thing that he encourages this church with is the fact that they stay faithful to his name despite the things that are going on around them, despite the hardships, the persecution, the martyrdom, that they're staying faithful. But he also speaks against them in the areas where they're um, not following him faithfully. And the things that he points out are holding to false teaching, to idolatry, and to sexual immorality. And so Jesus in this passage is revealing himself as a God with a sharp sword in his mouth, um, which is consistent with Revelation 19, which is Jesus the judge who's making war against the evil of the earth. And so he's a God who will speak against us where we're wrong, where we're, we, who will speak against us where we need to be corrected. Keep it on, keep it on. We're almost done. I'm sorry, the card is full. You have video? Yeah, let's go. Okay. <laughs> so he reveals himself as one who will speak against us where we need to be corrected, but he also shows himself as one who will encourage us in times of hardship. And so what we can take away from this is that he sees everything that's happening in our lives, good and bad, and he's able to address both. Accordingly, he's able to address both in the way that we need, not necessarily in the way that we want. Um, And also at the end, he shows that there's a reward for those who stay faithful to him and to who to those who overcome, that he'll give some of the hidden manna, and he will also give a white stone with the name written on it that no one... (laughs) 
He will also give a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to those who receive it. All right, we can get something out of that. Pergamum was one of the places that the Roman Empire allowed uh, capital punishment to happen at. And so um, one of the commentaries that I read on this said that the way that capital punishment was symbolized with a picture was with a sword. And so that would make sense why the Lord chose to reveal himself as the one with the sharp double-edged sword. In a way, he's playing on that idea of like earthly government, earthly authority, earthly judges um, punishing or like sentencing someone. And he's, he's kind of playing on that and acknowledging that, but he's saying, I'm the one with the sharp double-edged sword, and I'm the one that can punish. I'm the ultimate judge. I'm God. And so when you put that into its proper context, it makes so much more sense why he showed himself to the church, to that church in that way. Banyo means bathroom. And this is modern day, what is the name? Uh, Akisar. There's not much left of Thyatira. It's uh, it's it's pretty much gone. There, there's a few buildings there, and uh, those buildings were were um, there's a, a church from like the fourth century, and there's some um, an an old marketplace uh, agora there. When we got there, it, it was about the size of a city block, basically, like right in the middle of all the the busy street, people everywhere. I was just thinking, like, we have to be prepared because I don't want my camera dying, I don't want the audio recorder to mess up again, and so I'm just kind of really nervous to see what's going to happen with this equipment once we got to Thyatira, but um, everything went well, and I think it was one of the smoothest, smoothest videos that we did. I saw these little boys that uh, ran up to the fence because it's like this little fenced-in area, and they're just like looking at us like, what are you doing? Like, who the heck are you? And so I had them throw up the deuces, uh, the tourist peace sign uh, for the camera. And that was pretty cool. But um, Thyatira was really smooth. It was really cool. And just for me, like thinking about um, just looking at those stones, looking at those like uh, the foundation of that place. I was just thinking like, I wonder who was here. I wonder what happened within these walls. Like there's so much history there and you don't really like know what exactly happened, but your mind just wonders like what would have taken place there. So you want me to be dark? Yeah, like here. And I'm gonna hold the Bible like here or here. Revelation 2, 18 through 29 says to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, these are the words of the son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of, of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over nations. 
He will rule them with an iron scepter and dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I, I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He reveals himself as the Son of God, which is one of the only places in the book of Revelation where the term Son of God is used, and I think it's actually the only place. But uh, the Son of God, the one whose eyes are like blazing fire, and the one whose feet are like burnished bronze. And I thought that was interesting because after doing some research, I found that um, there was a lot of pagan worship in that city, and one of the gods that they would have worshipped was, uh, I forget his name, but he was known, the most popular one was known to be a son of the gods. And so for the Lord to come in and say, I'm the son of God, and to reveal himself in that way, again, is is a jab at their pagan gods, but it's it's really relevant to who they were, and they would have understood that terminology, and it would have caused something in them to click, or this curiosity to know more about the Lord. And he also says in in the passage of Scripture, the message to them that he's the one who searches hearts and minds. Um, and so I just think that that's really important. It's an important thing to understand about the Lord because a lot of times I think that we look at him and think he sees us going to church, so he thinks that's awesome, or he sees me reading my Bible, he thinks that's awesome. But sometimes we forget that he searches our heart and our mind. And so even the darkest places that maybe even uh, the places of our heart that we've compartmentalized and we've blocked it out, he still sees those places. And he still sees those places in our minds where we think certain thoughts about people or about ourselves. And then we move on to think about other things. But he searches our heart and our mind. And so that revelation of him, I think, is really important. That's been my relationship with the Lord, man. It's just Him digging into my heart, me giving Him permission to dig into my heart like that and Him doing it, but also me uh, going deeper and deeper into His heart in the process. And I feel like that that's what Christianity is all about. I would go back and do it a million bajillion times if I could because it was so fun and it was such a blessing to me. And... Even aside from the trip, the experience with my friends and family leading up to the trip was life-changing in and of itself because I saw sides of my friends and sides of my family that I'd never seen before. And I never, I, I'm telling you, man, like I, I felt so loved and so taken care of uh, by God through my friends and family. That was just one of the most life-changing things about this whole thing. to Sardis we got there were two different sites there and they were probably about five to ten minutes apart and so we get to um, these places probably like we get to the first place like 15 20 minutes before it closes and so we really had to like go for it and um, so we get there and it's like in the middle of nowhere so it's extremely quiet and super peaceful And there's no one there. And man, it was just like, it was a breathtaking thing to, to, to see. Hey. I think this would be a cool place right here. Yeah. Can you stay in here with that in the background?
Sardis. Sardis is my personal favorite. Um, I just, I really like seeing um, the Temple of Artemis there. The, the pillars really give me an appreciation for how big the, these ancient temples must have been. Uh, one of the coolest things about Sardis is that right there, and right on the platform of the Temple of Artemis, they, they built a church several hundred years later. Um, and so it's kind of crazy to, to know that they were meeting in this church building. And if you look out the window, you see the, the huge, huge pillars that were the, for the Temple of Artemis. Um, Sardis is separated into two locations. And so the first location is where the gymnasium and the synagogue are. Um, so we went there first and got to play around on the toilets and um, kind of go through the gymnasium. The gymnasium's been reconstructed. It's, it's beautiful. It's huge. Um, but the, the synagogue is really significant that um, it's proof that the Jews were living there, um, which is important um, for our history. Um, and it really it gives us support to, to the reason why, the, why Paul would have gone to speak there. Um, the, the synagogue in Sardis is, is interesting though because it's one of the only synagogues in the world that they found that still has uh, remnants of, of pagan worship. And so they didn't completely destroy all of the, the parts of the temple that were used for pagan. And so the, there's a, a, a reading table there that's actually uh, made from an old pagan lion. And, um, it's just interesting to see how they worked with what they had and, and put it together. Um, but it still has beautiful mosaic floors and um, you can really get a feeling of what the, the first century, second century synagogues would have felt like. So what would happen is you would come in here and there would be a slave at the door and for whatever amount of money he'd sell you a stick with cotton wrapped around the end of it. Yeah. So you would sit here and you would do your business with like a toga on. Yeah. Well, Okay, so this is Sardis. And in Revelation 3, starting in verse 1, it says, To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains, and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hey, Jordan. Yeah. Go. Okay, so now the next place is like, uh, we need that book. I've never had a date before. I think what you see is that this church, he says, you have this reputation of being alive, but you're not. And um, that that's just so profound to me because I think that, that we can have this perspective of our lives that we're living it a certain way or that we have this certain reputation and we're seeing it from this earthly perspective, but he's seeing it from an eternal heavenly perspective. And so he's got the right point of view that we need to be able to see. And so for him to give a message like that, um, I think is is really important for someone to be able to see something from his point of view. So the way this trip happened, um, man, it was crazy. Basically, I had been doing my Apocalypse videos 
blowing up YouTube, blowing up social media, Twitter, Facebook, and um, a couple that mentors me, their son lives in Istanbul, Turkey, and he has um, this uh, interest in videography. Um, he's lived in the area for a while, so he knows all the tourist places. He's gone to the some of the seven church sites before, and um, he's got this passion for scripture. And so he had been watching my videos, and I didn't even know that he had. Yeah, it was just kind of a random day, and I, I saw that Jordan was on Facebook, and I watched one of his videos of, of Apocalypsis, and I, I just thought, man, it'd be really cool if we could do these same videos, but doing the actual locations um, of the Churches of Revelations. And I was just at um, this couple's house one day, just hanging out, helping them out with a garage sale. And um, they end up talking to their son on the, on the phone, like through FaceTime or Skype or whatever. And uh, he asked if he could talk to me. And so we just chat a little bit. And he's like, hey, I saw some of your videos. Why don't you come over here to Turkey and I'll take you on a tour of the seven churches of the book of Revelation since that's the kind of uh, stuff that you're doing your Bible study over. And I'm just like, yeah, right. And so just kind of out of the blue, I messaged him and was like, hey, what do you think about doing a live video in Turkey? And he's like, uh, yeah, I've never thought about that before. I said, well, just pray about it and get back to me. Yeah, and one thing led to another and he, he was here, so um, I'm not really sure how that worked out, but it, it was really cool. Um, in the back of my mind, thinking, like, there's no possible way. There's no way I could raise the money. There's no way that... Um, there's just no way, because I'd never been outside of the country, and um, so flying over the ocean was, like, kind of scary to me, plus all of the, like, terrorism stuff that's happening, and I was just like, no way. Um but I told him, I was just like, yeah, if I stumble across the money, then I'll consider it. And from that point forward, it was like God did nothing but confirm this trip. And it was probably the last thing, the very last thing I ever expected to happen when I first started doing these videos. But um, the way God confirmed it, I could sit here for like a week telling you stories but the short version of that is that God confirmed it. I think it's really important to understand what the Lord does in these first few chapters of the book of Revelation because He's revealing Himself specific details and specific aspects of His person. Um, and I think that it's important to understand those first few chapters if you want to understand the rest of the book and the rest of God's end time plan because I think the deeper that you go um, you'll really have to have an understanding of Jesus the judge Jesus the bridegroom and Jesus the king um, but but most specifically the judge because um, because basically the Lord has revealed himself as the lamb he has revealed himself as the sacrificial lamb and that aspect of who he is he's already hit, expressed himself as the lamb fully meaning that um, he'll never be uh, he'll never die on the cross again and so the full expression of Jesus Christ the lamb has already been revealed or it's already happened now Jesus the judge Jesus the king and Jesus the bridegroom um, we haven't seen the full revelation of Jesus in those uh, specific uh, just in those specific ways yet he's judging us because he loves us and he loves us therefore he judges us and so I think that's really really important to understand I think that's a message that's going to get um, less and less popular but I think it's also going to be more and more important to understand that because of the fact that Jesus the judge uh, that revelation or that expression of who Jesus is hasn't reached its fullness yet and so you'll see it crescendo at the end of the age where Jesus will operate as a judge. We're living in a time where it's more and more important to understand these things. And I think that it's more, it's, 
we're living in a time where it's more and more important for us to be in right standing with God and on the same page with Him because I think that we're going to see shifts in the earth and to rightly interpret what's happening in the earth, in our own nation, in our own state, in our own families, that it's going to be important um, to be on the same page with the Lord so that we interpret world events through His eyes and through His perspective and not our own opinion. Because um, that's the only way we're going to be on the right side of history, and that's the only way we're going to be um, in the right position in prayer because we're on the same page with Him. I'm Jeff Boston Chambers from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I'm a professional tattoo artist. Uh, I've been working in a shop for about nine years, been doing professionally for about five and a half. Um, right now I'm working at a stage two tattoo in Oklahoma City. Um, the style that I prefer the most, that I enjoy looking at and doing, is your American traditional. Um, just real simple, basic, bold outline, solid color. Um, just kind of timeless looking to me. Um, and motivationally wise, I mean, I just love it. Every day you get to push yourself, you get to try new things, meet new people on a daily basis, you know, build relationships with people. Um, one of the few jobs you get where you talk to somebody for multiple hours at a time um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, so it makes the job really pleasant. Honestly, I kind of fell into it. Um, I mean, I've always liked them, I loved them, um, but growing up, they were illegal in Oklahoma. Um, started hanging around a tattoo shop, uh, became a front counter guy, helped them with all the little day-to-day -day tasks, and uh, Jamil Jackson asked me if I wanted to do it as a profession, so I took the opportunity and ran with it. For me, coming to Christ, um, I grew up in a Christian home, um, so I church every Sundays, but uh, when I was eight or nine years old, there was a message at the church that really spoke to me. Um, afterwards, went home, had the lunch, um, talked to my mom, and uh, she took me into a room and we kind of went down the whole Romans Road of Salvation. She prayed with me and that's when I first accepted Christ in my life. I think God's changed me in a lot of ways. Um, definitely helps me stay disciplined, try to uh, stay out of trouble. He, uh, just knowing that he's there and cares kind of keeps me from a lot of the stuff that I could fall into temptation-wise. Uh, keeping your faith in a tattoo shop um, definitely can be challenging. Um, there's a lot of issues or temptations you can fall into with our industry. Um, there's a lot of stuff that uh, can damage you. Um, but for me, I work around a couple guys that are really strong in their faith. Um, they help keep me on the straight and narrow. Um, whenever I do start to slip up, they're there to get me back on track, um, keep me focused on doing God's will. Biggest influence for me would probably be, well, spiritually speaking, would probably be my parents. Um, great Christian people, um, don't sugarcoat anything. They're very blunt. Um, you always know that what they're telling you is for your best interest, not for any kind of self-gain, so they definitely have influenced me spiritually a lot, artistically. The guys I work with, um, Jamil, he's definitely helped mold and create me into the artist I am today. Some of the most people probably wouldn't know about me is that tattooing wasn't really my first passion and drive for career base. I really wanted to be a uh, youth minister for the longest time. When I'm gone, what do I want people to remember of me? Um, pretty much, you know, you know, you can follow your dreams and take any career path and still keep your faith, um, even if it's in a, you know, controversial, quote unquote, uh, industry. Um, 
and then just to love everybody, man. Uh, I try to treat everybody with the same respect um, that I work with, that I deal with, that I meet on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm just trying to, you know, do what Jesus said and, you know, spread his love, so. Why do you think it is? I think I saw it on this side. The all, all that shit here. Or what? Or Philadelphia. All that shit. I think. St. John's Church. We got to Philadelphia after dark. Um, we couldn't see much of it, but there's really not much left of, of Philadelphia. Um, there is an interesting story. It was, Philadelphia is one of the newest of the seven cities that was founded. And it was founded by one of the Pergamum kings. And the, the ruler of, of Philadelphia um, was asked to turn against his brother. And, and he refused. Um, he remained loyal to his brother throughout that, which is um, part of the reason why the city is called Philadelphia. By the time we get on the road to head there, it's dark. Um, the sun had gone down. We're kind of getting tired, and um, once we get there, it's just like, it's so dark that it kind of feels pointless to try to do a video, but we wanted to be sure to hit all seven places, and so even if that meant we're going to shoot a video in the dark where you can barely even see my face, then so be it. And, and again, it was one of those kind of things where it's like, you, we just wanted to capture something on camera to take home. And so I think it actually adds an interesting element or an interesting spin on the videos because I think it shows the determination and I think it shows um, just the, the zeal and the, the passion behind this trip and what we were actually doing. And what made this one even more interesting was it was right next to a mosque. And the mosque was just letting out of like prayer time or something like that. And so there I am with this Bible in the middle of a street, a busy, fairly busy street, um, reading scriptures in the dark in front of this place that's closed. And so uh, I, I had this like uncomfortable feeling seeing those guys just kind of pour out of that mosque, um, wondering like, what are they going to think? What are they going to do? And but... Um, we just stayed with it and did it. And so I think it looks ridiculous when you watch it, but I think the heart behind it uh, is really awesome. Yeah. Okay. So in Revelation 3, starting in verse 7, it says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of a synagogue, who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you, since you have kept my commands to endure patiently. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he... Never again will he leave you. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of him from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The significant thing about this revelation is that he shows himself as the one who holds the key of David. And that's a reference to uh, Isaiah 22, where Eliakim, 
Uh, he is uh, dressed in a robe. He's got the sash. And um, the scripture says that the key of David was put on his shoulder. So he's given access into this royalty. And I think that um, if you were to read that passage and then go back and see what Jesus says in the book of Revelation to the Church of Philadelphia, you'll see that he's basically saying that um, he has the access to the royal place and he sits in this royal position as a king. And so um, this really unveils a different aspect of the Lord that we haven't been seeing in the other churches is that he shows himself as a king of this kingdom. Immediately after Philadelphia, we stay the night at Pamakali, which is uh, the hot springs. So this is the we're getting into the message to Laodicea, but we're we're staying the night at Pamakale, wake up in the morning, eat breakfast really quickly, and go up to Hierapolis, which is on top of this mountain, and there are sights to see up there and everything, and that was that was really awesome. But the hot springs were amazing. Uh, we got there, I kicked off my shoes and socks and I just hopped right in, um, started getting some video. And it was just so cool to have known about this place, read the scripture, and just to to know the historical context, but then to finally show up there and stand in those hot springs. That was amazing. There were so many people just like standing around, taking off their shoes and socks and just walking around in there. And it was like, the place looked like a snow-capped mountain kind of, but um, the temperature was pretty decent and uh, the, the surface was sticky. And it was like, when you look at it, you think you're going to slide because it's like wet and it doesn't look like you can just walk down it and be safe. You know, I thought I was gonna like fall over the edge at one point, but when you stand on it, it's sticky. So you get this like really good grip and you can walk up and down uh, the sides of the springs. And so I thought that was really awesome. What, uh, did you pray? Yeah. Did you just pray for us? Yeah. Lord, thank you for this food. This time of fellowship, I ask that you just bless it um, and bless the food for the nourishment of our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So you were going to explain to us, you, what did you explain before? You, what you learned spiritually or what you... Oh, okay, so... You said biggest misconceptions, right? Yeah. Um, no, the biggest lessons that I learned. Well, I think there are two. The number one biggest misconception... No, the number one biggest lesson is to not just assume that you're not going to like something and don't assume that something is going to be bad um, before you even get there, before you even experience it, before you ever meet the person or the people. Um, that's definitely one of the biggest. And then the other thing, for me, it was such a challenge to even believe that it was possible. Um, I didn't believe that anyone would donate money um, for me to come here. I didn't believe that... Um, I don't think part of me believed that God would keep me safe. Um, so I was confronted with a lot of those 
uh, lack of faith type of things. But after this, I will definitely, definitely look at every other country and culture differently with an open mind. And um, thanks, with an open mind and with the. Get a go. Get a go. What is that? I was gonna have you take a drink and just try it out. What is this? Iron. It's not too bad. It tastes like lime. Hmm. Is that what it is? I think it's fermented yogurt or something. <laughs> mm. Wow. Orada veya burada. Yol dedik ya. Şu geldiğin yol var şimdi bak. Hı -hı. Burası. Hemen şurası. Sağ. 100 metre üstünde. Tamam. Çok Buraya çıktın mı? Şu yolu Lahutki yazıyor zaten orada. Bekçi kulübesi var orada. Bekçiler var. Hı -hı. Onlara sorarsın gönderirler sana. What? All right, so I'm standing here at Laodicea. If you look over here, you can see Pamukkale about 10 miles this way. Uh, that's where the hot water would have come from. Uh, if you look over here, uh, Colossae is over there. That's where the cold water would have come from. Um, Revelations 3.14 says, To the church in Laodicea, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witnesses, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are the wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. That That's important, because this is a place where there was a lot of gold and there was a lot going on here as a, a place of merchants and um, this is one of the most wealthiest cities in, the, in this area. Um, I really see a parallel between this city and, and what we have in America. Uh, we're so, so consumed with our own wealth and, and how much we have and want that, that we trade that for the, the things of God. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So where Laodicea is um, on the map is right in between Pamukkale, the hot springs, and Colossae. And so Pamukkale has these hot springs and the hot water would have flowed to uh, Laodicea. And by the time it got there, 
it was lukewarm. And then again in Colossae, the water is cold, um, and it flowed to Laodicea also, but by the time it got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. And so the Lord's message, he, he's playing on that, and he's saying, you're neither hot nor cold, so I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And basically what he's saying is, you're not being useful to me. And so um, I think that uh, shows a part of the Lord that is more aggressive than what we're used to hearing. And I, but I think it's important to consider that because he really desires to see us um, do things in his name. He really desires to see us uh, serve him by serving other people. The thing about Laodicea is that they think, if you read the passage, they think that they're a certain type of church or a certain type of people. And then the Lord comes in and he says, no, I think something different. And so they think they're rich. He says they're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And so I think that shows us that it's so important to have a perspective of our lives that that we see through God's eyes instead of our own. He reveals himself as the amen, uh, the faithful and true witness, and the ruler of God's creation. And I think what that's saying is when the Lord says something will happen or when he says he will do something, we can take that to mean that it will happen the way he says it will happen and that he will do the thing that he says he will do. And that's important for us to know about him because he's true to his word. And whatever he says, we can count on that thing happening. So, yeah, I definitely approach other cultures with an open mind. And I would also approach God differently, too, and not just assume that because I think something is impossible that he thinks it's impossible. How do you think seeing these places will will change the way you read your Bible? Man. Now, like, having walked there and knowing that they're real places, I kind of look at it like those churches were... Um, made up of people who were real people who had real issues and so each each message to each church was a message to real people who were just like me and so if God can see them in their situation and say look you're neither cold nor hot and that was like unique to those people that he could do the same for me and um Sometimes I think that I've approached God and thought, well, I'm just insignificant me. What could he possibly have to say to me? But I keep learning that that's not true and that he can speak a a specific message. And also, I think um, it just brings it to life more. And it's not just words on a page. What are you eating? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. It tastes like a quesadilla, though. Goes to me. Goes to me. And it um, is potatoes. Potatoes and cheese. And cheese. And it was mm. made by an authentic village woman sitting on the ground. Nice. That's awesome. Have you learned any Turkish while you've been here? Oh. Yeah. So I've learned Su, which is... Water. I've learned Merhaba, which is hello. I've learned Teşekkürler, which I've said probably, I feel like a thousand times. Mm. I learned other words, but forgot them. I learned wait or slow down. I learned be careful. I forgot them. What what was your impression versus reality of um, your expectations versus reality of the language difference? What did you think it was going to be like, and how has it actually been? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, so I usually had people with me that spoke Turkish. That made things a lot easier. But the times that I was left alone, the little short periods of time that I was left alone without someone to translate, was really cool because there are certain things that translate without words. Emotions, facial expressions, gestures, um, 
even sounds that you make. Um, and I think that's cool to see how laughter translates, joy translates, anger translates. And I remember one of my probably favorite moments of the whole trip was uh, sitting in Ali's house, uh, the mechanic. Water. They made me coffee. And I was tasting Turkish coffee for the first time. And I took a sip of it, and it was super strong but super sweet. And so I was like, woo! And <laughs> they laughed like really hard. And so it was like I didn't have to say anything or like articulate something in this, in this complex way. It was just this emotion or this reaction I had, and it made them laugh. And so it was like we had this experience that was like super cool. Do I need to drink the water first? Sue. Are they saying drink the water first? Yeah. <laughs> Now you can now you can continue. <laughs> Woo. Woo. <laughs> <laughs>
left a scroll behind or somewhere Jesus laid his head to rest or he ate food. And so what this experience has done is caused me to look at scripture and know that these places are real, which proves that the things that we read about are real and the God who inspired this book is real. Uh, Ephesus was really just the, the thriving hub of the ancient world. Uh, they had the Temple of Artemis there and it, it was a main attraction. Um, Ephesus is situated on the, the Meanders River, um, which is where we get our English word meander because it be, just kind of goes goes where it wants to. Um, and so the ancient city of Ephesus was, was on the coast, but today's city is about three miles away from the water. Um, and that's explained because of the, the Meander River. It was depositing silt, and so it just kept depositing more and more silt, and it kept pushing the water line farther and farther away from the city. In the scripture, he reveals himself as the one who holds the seven stars in the palm of his, his right hand. And it all, he also reveals himself as the one who walks among the golden lampstands. And so the thing that that says to me is that he's present with his church. He walks among them. He walks with them. And I think that speaks volumes when we consider relationship with God. And all the more since since the thing that he says to this church is that they've forsaken their first love. So I think the Lord is showing where his priority is and what's important to him. And the thing about love is that it, it's so multidimensional that there's no one way to love someone, and especially God. And so I think this is just highlighting the fact that he wants us. He wants us to be close to him. And he wants us to love him with everything we have. It's amazing to me how the Lord can see someone's deeds and praise that and encourages that, but at the same time, that person isn't in love with Him anymore. And I just think that that's so thought-provoking because we can do so many things in His name and we can do so many church-type things. And then He says, you've forsaken your first love. And so I think that it, it calls for a very, very sensitive heart. Um, to him to be able to know the difference and to be able to say or or discern when when you've gone too far in one direction and you're not loving him anymore okay so this there's an i there's a chi there's a theta there's a epsilon and there's a epsilon. Mm. And together they stand for Jesus Christ, Son of God. Thanks. Okay, so this is Ephesus. And in Revelation 2, starting verse 1, it says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you, you have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. In this scripture, Jesus reveals himself as one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the golden lampstands. And to me, this is saying that he's showing ownership and he's also showing relationship in that he's walking with his church. One of the main rebukes that he has for this church is that they had forsaken their first love. And in this scripture, Jesus is showing that he prioritizes love and he prioritizes relationship. And that's basically the gospel that because of God's love that he had for his creation, 
uh, he became a man and he died in our place for our sin. He took the penalty upon himself. He received the wrath of God upon himself so that we didn't have to receive it. And he died the death that we couldn't. And when he died, he broke the power of death. He broke the power of the grave and he was raised to life and he ascended into heaven and achieved victory over sin and over death so that in him, if we believe in him, if we repent and give our lives to him, we're made new, we're forgiven of our sin, and we're restored back to right relationship and right standing with Him. So love is a top priority for God. And we see in the scripture that He'll do whatever it takes to tell us uh, what we're doing wrong to correct us. And in love, He's gonna discipline us and He's gonna do whatever it takes to flesh out His kingdom through us, to flesh out His will through us, and to restore His relationship so that we're clean, we're free of sin, and that we're in right standing with Him. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after Thee. You alone are my heart's desire. Joy 
giver and the apple of my eye. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your presence. You I thank you that your ear is attentive to our my strength, my I Thank you, Lord, for who you are. I thank you that you're high and lifted up, that you are exalted above all things. God, I thank you that every solution to every problem is in your hands. Lord, you're the one that created the heavens and the earth. And I thank you, God, that you're so much bigger than any issue, than any problem. I thank you, Lord, that you died on the cross for us. You took the penalty of sin upon yourself so that we could walk away free, so that we could actually experience you and come into relationship with you. Lord, I thank you for the love that overflows out of your heart for us. I pray, God, that you would help us to come to know this love. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would transform our hearts, that you would transform our minds. At the reading of your word, at the hearing of your word, God, I pray that you would cause something in us to shift in Jesus' name, that we would come to know you better than we did before. You are so much bigger than anything else that we could possibly turn to. Help us to see the deception and the sin in the world that we live in. Help us to turn away from it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Help us to experience you, Lord. Teach us how to prepare the way for you to return. Teach us how to prepare the way for you to return back into our hearts, God. Help us to see that home is with you. Home is in your family and home is in your kingdom, God. And I pray for the ones that are lost, Lord, to come back home to you. And I pray that it would be your love, God, that transforms us. In Jesus' name. I ask that your kingdom come and that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. interesting thing was uh, all of the little side things that you couldn't predict or couldn't uh, foresee happening, like the stuff going bad at, where was it, Pergamon? Mm -hmm. That was crazy to see happen. And then just getting to each place was fun, but... Um, I think the coolest for sure was Ephesus uh, just because it was so big and saw the ichthus on the ground but yeah seven churches 31 hours yeah five the first day two the second day some places we had 15 minutes 20 minutes and others hours but...